Welcome to Liberty Unlocked. I'm Don Watkins. Today we have a really interesting conversation with a really interesting guy, Nikos Sotorikopoulos. And as you'll see, one of the really fascinating things about Nikos's story is that he came from a background in Marxism. And one of the points I made to him was that I have a certain envy of people who came to be pro-liberty and uh, to support objectivism from very different ideological backgrounds because I think you learn a lot both about persuasion and even about understanding your own ideas because you have a sense of not just you know Ayn Rand's making certain kinds of arguments about the different branches of philosophy but of different approaches to what the issues in philosophy are and what the questions and what the right answers are and so I've been thinking about for those of us who don't come from very different philosophic backgrounds, how do we in effect recreate that advantage? And my number one suggestion right now is, well, I mean, you can do the opposite, right? Which doesn't mean that, you know, you go and become a Kantian, but it's learn one major school of thought inside and out. And so, for example, if we're just talking about the level of politics, you know, if you're a supporter of liberty, learn Rawls inside and out, or, you know, you can pick somebody else, but I would say pick somebody in a different camp. It's, it's also very helpful to know thinkers who are similar, but different in their approach. So, for example, I would encourage, you know, objectivists to study, for instance, Nozick and how he thinks about capitalism and what the similarities or differences is. And uh, definitely check out Ankar Gatte's piece on Nozick versus Rand in, um, I'm going blank on what it's called, but the the collection edited by Robert Mayhew and Gregory Salmieri on Ayn Rand's politics. And you'll get some interesting insights. But like you pick a school of thought or a thinker who's a good contrast. If you want to go into philosophy, uh, the thinker that I'm most interested in as a contrast to Ayn Rand is Hume. And, you know, you don't only want to know Hume, right? But he sets up Kant and he's cashing in on the empiricists who came before like Locke. So, but the idea is that know at least one thinker or school of thought that's in a contrast to yours in a really rigorous depth. And what that means is not that like you're an all-time scholar on them, but it's that you can, you know how they think. You can, you can explain and you can in effect project, well, this is the kinds of problems that they would raise with my ideas. This is why they disagree. This is how their ideas would apply to different specific issues. And I think that you know, it's, it, that takes time and it's an investment, but that's the kind of investment that can really pay off precisely for the reasons that people who come from a different philosophic background uh, have certain benefits that they enjoy from that once they come to hold a new and, in my view, true way of looking at the world. So as always, the best way to stay in touch is to go to donswriting.com and sign up for the newsletter. You can support the show financially at libertyunlocked.com. And now on to the conversation with Nikos. All right. Well, thanks for coming on the show. So where, where in the world are you located, by the way? Normally, I'm located in the UK at York. Uh, currently, I'm in Athens, in uh, where I grew up and where the family house is. All right. So uh, we've interacted a little bit, um, I, I think, just in the last year. And so I don't know a ton about you, but I was intrigued to talk to you because I saw you posted something about basically, you know, you started out as like complete Marxist and now yes. are an advocate for freedom and uh, and are interested in objectivist ideas. And so... Before we kind of go back into that story, which is intriguing, just a little bit of sort of what you do now, like what are what, what are the things that you're focused on? Yes, so my day job is that I'm a senior lecturer in social sciences at York St. John University, but at the same time, I'm a, the director of Ayn Rand Institute Europe, which basically means I am running the European programs of ARI, and I'm also the academic advisor to Ayn Rand Center UK, with Razi and we're doing events and we have the daily objective, a daily Facebook live. So where we do some commentary on current affairs, hopefully from an objectivist point of view without us being experts in objectivism. That's interesting. So you, you're in the social sciences, which is not generally where we expect 
to find pro liberty people. I mean, one of the, one of the problems is that at least in the United States, so bad that better people don't even kind of want to go through there. So I'm curious as to what your experience is and, and what uh, attracted you to the field. So actually, my job title, if I would give one to myself, would be in polit- I'm in political theory. But because it happened that my PhD supervisor was in sociology, I started teaching sociology. Then my first proper lectureship was the sociology lectureship. And that's how it went from there. So because it's such a wide field, it's easy to talk about things like, for example, why globalization is important, why trade makes us better off, uh, why individual agency is, in my opinion, more important than, let's say, the structures of society. So there is, there is space to have interesting discussion and offer a different point of view to the students. But in terms of the environment being, quote, hostile, intellectually hostile, I think the, the way to go is to be a good guy, be pleasant to work with, be a good colleague. And luckily, up to now, I've had only minimal, if any, problems. So I haven't been canceled yet, nor have I faced any, any problems. I think that there's a certain attitude that when I, you know, I will talk about just sort of like interacting with people on the premise that even if they hold really wrong ideas, like be interested in what was it positive attracting to them. There's sort of more the like a contempt for the other side, along with a almost uh, air of superiority about having contempt for the other side. And I'm curious how you think about the positive value. Cause I, I mean, I, I certainly agree with you that strategically you want good relationships with the people you work with. And that can go a long way of, um, even if there's fundamental disagreement about ideas at not being hostile. Um, how do you think about that sort of issue and, and finding value um, with people who have very divergent views? Well, I think it's important to make sure that you don't sanction someone who is not a good person or not to sanction, to pretend that you sanction someone's ideas so that you remain friends. But interestingly, I've had most in, more in, interesting discussions that with people who consider themselves Marxists and interested in reading and being engaged with ideas. And the people I haven't had good relationship with is people who are not so interested in the ideas, but are interested in, let's say, passing the party line on issues around diversity or what people loosely call political correctness. So quite interestingly, with people that you have a lot of things to debate and you engage in discussion, you are, quote, safe from them. The problem is with people who tell you the discussion is over or why are you asking me, for example, what is the definition of a, of a man or of a woman, whereas uh, So these are the people with whom I don't engage because you get some hostility in the air and there's not a point. So you shouldn't see yourself specifically in academia as being on a mission. So the best thing you can do is if with some people you hang out with your gym buddies or you go out and you have a good time and you can see where they come from and also maybe that they have the right premises but they make mistakes of error to use the, the objectivist uh, jargon on that, on that thing, which was also my situation for decades. And because I was that guy, I am a, I'm in a position to cut a bit slack to people rather than write them off as bad people for having bad ideas. So let's sort of go back to the very beginnings. How did you get interested in ideas generally, political ideas in particular? You know, where did you start out in this whole journey? Well, it starts with uh, with my home. So both my parents were and still are very politicized. Uh, my mother had a very played a very active role in the revolt against the dictatorship in Greece, the dictatorship that lasted from 67 to 74. So Greece has a very turbulent political history. And in this political history, the narrative is that the left were the good guys and the persecuted. So the left were the people who fought the Nazis in the mountains. And then after, after the occupation was over, they were persecuted. Now, this is not exactly what happened, but that, this is what passes in the popular culture. So you grow up, and if you're, if you're excited with ideas around freedom or people not accepting tyranny, or if you like art, for example, in Greece, the, the art was dominated by the left. 
the left is almost the obvious solution because specifically in Greece, the right is very parochial. They don't stand for ideas. Uh, they are this middle of the road and they mostly they're based on tradition. So if you happen to be an atheist and if you happen to be loosely what we'd call liberal, interested in the enlightenment, in, in, in creativity and all that stuff, unfortunately, the left was the only presentable, let's say, option. And the issue is that there is also a lack of alternative. So when the right, when the right wingers are debating you, they're not going to tell you, look, your premises are wrong. And this is why, for example, you know, individualism is important. They will tell you, look, I understand that you have the moral, let's say, high ground. It's just that your means are not good. And this has been proven in history. But this is not very convincing. People are inspired by ideas. So my thought was, look, if the leftists are the good guys, then we should go full in. And what is the most, what is the most consistent part of the left? The Communist Party. And that's how I found myself very early in my 20s being a, an active activist, let's say, in the, in the communist youth. And what would have been, so, you know, so you came to this through an interest in ideas and sounds like idealism. Uh, what would have been, I would say, the kinds of things that you were reading? And I'm interested sort of what the ideas you were imbibing and how much you were aware or thought about the actual history of communism in practice. Right. So in, in Greece, where the Communist Party is a very serious force to be reckoned with in politics, they have almost their own literature and their own alternative history. So for every crime or for everything that you would believe and which is actually morally unacceptable, there is a convenient answer. And the convenient answer in general is that history is written by the winners. The imperialists are the winners. But we have cut the imperialists lying time and again, quite often with Greece being the victim, as, for example, with the occupation of the northern Cyprus by, by the Turkish army, when the idea was that the United States have threw, thrown us under the bus. So the idea is the imperialists are the bad guys. And by the way, the conservatives agree with that. They don't like the materialism and, let's say, the hedonism of uh, the American way of life. So there is this consensus that these are the bad guys. So then you can find many rationalizations, specifically if you are a second-hander, and I was as a second-hander as one can get. So all I was trying to find is, can I find one obscure author who says, for example, that the, that the victims of Stalinism were actually 800,000? And he had some photocopies from KGB archives and says, look, this is the actual number. Therefore, you know, in a country of some tens of millions, yes, we made some mistakes. We're really sorry. But many of these people were kulaks. So, you know. So if you're looking for a rationalization to believe an evil idea, you're going to find it. And that was that's, basically me. That's so interesting. I mean, it reminds me so much of religion in that whether it's Christianity or particularly I, I'm aware of the way that like Mormons will do this, they have, you know, a whole apologetics literature that will give you, if you want to believe, reasons to justify everything that in effect you have to fend off from attacks. And it's it, it doesn't hold up if you actually actively read outside of there and are intellectually honest. But w w I mean, it's frustrating to me in that I feel like on the side of what's right, we don't even have like, you know, a, a um, you can't even kind of get answers to what's the best thinking on particular issues, let alone like every single historic event, you know, some, some sort of answer for it. I mean, that's one of the reasons, you know, I wrote a book, Roosevelt Care, which focused on the, the America before and after the welfare state. And the reason I wrote it is because like, that seemed very useful to know and nobody had written it. And I'm not a historian and, and had no desire to be, but it was like to answer that I had to do a lot of homework, which mostly by the way, consisted of reading left wing authors because they were the only ones writing about really what was going on before the welfare state. And I mean, there's a certain virtue to that and that they don't have any vested interest in saying things that I like. So if they do say something, I, you know, I don't, have the means of like a traditional historian to assess okay you know what were they basing it on and 
but at least I have some sort of confidence. And just so everybody knows, this is the first time it's really rained since I've lived in this house, and uh, it will probably get picked up a little bit. No, it is still now. It's, uh, it's, it's okay. But, but so I have I- a certain admiration for the, the Marxists for their, uh, let's say, uh, productivity of just sheer words. And, and there's also another thing that made me be passionate about what I was doing. And I think it was a sense of a mistaken sense of life. So already, so for example, the reason I liked Soviet art and specifically the early Soviet art is the spirit of heroism. So if you see, if you see a Soviet movie, let's say of the early twenties and you take it out of context, but not too much out of context, you can easily imagine these people as larger than life heroes. They're the guys who, when the white army attacked, they are in the front line. Imagine, for example, Andrei Taganov from uh, With the Living. This, this is the kind of hero that inspired me. And in the Greek, uh, the, the culture of the Greek Communist Party, and Western people won't understand this, the average leftist in Greece, at least till some years ago, has nothing to do with the middle class snob, which is the average leftist in the West. The average, let's say, Communist Party militant was a person who walks up at five o'clock, goes to the construction work, is is the first to go to work. There was a slogan in the communist youth, we're first in the classroom and first in the struggle. So you have to, you have to be a good student. You have to aspire high. So again, all this is rationalizations and excuses, but that's actually what happened. So this was, it was this mistaken, let's say sense of life that made me find appeal in this, uh, uh, in these political circles. And so uh, I'm curious as to how you would have thought about I mean, you've given some indication of like you know everything is reframed is sort of rewritten by the by the imperialists um but to what extent did you feel confident in your views versus feeling like um i i, I don't know that i could just walk in and win every debate you're, you're a very good psychologist so actually the difference between my activism let's say now and then is back then i was way more shy and this could be two things. The one is a character issue. I was not, I was a different person. But the other is that I wasn't really confident about my ideas. Because as I mentioned, I was a major second hunter. And I will give you an example. And this example would be the movies that I would watch. I would watch pretentious uh, European cinema. One out of 10 movies, I would enjoy it. Nine out of 10 movies, I would try to persuade myself that I enjoyed it or I would spend two hours reading some critiques on why this is a brilliant film, but it didn't talk inside me. So, and for example, I would watch a quote cheap Hollywood film like the 300, which has this, you know, heroism and this uh, ideal, you know, you die, you you, you go for your values. And I would- Greek heroism. Sorry? Greek heroism. Greek heroism. The best kind, right? Yeah. But my, my explanation would be, you see, false consciousness. Instead of liking the higher culture, you like cheap uh, Hollywood bullshit. So, but at some point, you have to deal with these things. At some point, it comes a time where you can't evade anymore. So either you, let's say, die inside that you say, okay, I'll live a life without enjoying things, or you go for the things that you, that you really enjoy and you say, okay, I like this quote, cheap music or these cheap films, I'm gonna go with them. So this was something that helped me to, let's say, my later transition, that in terms of sense of life, at some point I made the decisions, no, I will do the things that I enjoy and not the things that are supposed to be uh, proper, you know, class conscious, uh, good stuff. And so now, what were you doing career-wise at this time? You said this is your early 20s, are you still in school or? Um, well, I'm still, what, I'm still. What's your overall direction? Yeah, so, so I was still a student and then I migrated to, to the UK and I was also working and I was feeling a bit torn because I was working in the summers as a paralegal because the original life plan was to be a lawyer. And it was this idea that, you know, we have to work in this capitalist society, but that's the bad part of the day. So as many people say in Greece, we don't, uh, we have to work to live, but not live to work. So it wasn't a pleasant experience. And interestingly, one of the things that really changed me was my army, my days in the army, and more specifically, my days in the presidential guard. 
because it was the first time that I found myself under an environment of strict discipline. And while it lasted, it sucked. But when it was over, it left me one good thing, which was at, for the first time, someone expected from me to get over myself, to be an adult, so to speak. Because, you know, the biggest blessing and the biggest curse of Greece is the close family ties. Mm. These have saved us for the, from the crisis, for example. But at the same time, they keep quite often, it gets some time till you become an adult. So after the army, I moved to the UK. I have to work 10 different part-time jobs. So then the sense of life issue becomes even more pressing. So for example, I watch TV series with you know uh, big executives or lawyers. And I'm like, this is the good guy, but I'm supposed to not like this guy, but I kind of like this guy. And I'm looking forward tomorrow to do an extra shift in my crappy job and get an extra <laughs> 50 pounds. So, so this is how it, again, it starts with a sense of life and the politics, it's just a matter of time for the politics to follow or the matter of meeting the right person or something like that. And so what was sort of the first step for you on a different intellectual road? So my first step was uh, meeting the group around uh, what uh, the festival, which is called Battle of Ideas in the UK. Some people might know the online magazine Spiked, or other people might know the Institute of Ideas, or then as it was called the Academy of Ideas. So initially, I, I, I was attached to this group because of a, of a friend of mine. And initially, I, I, I really disliked them. I, I was, so these are let's say, old Marxist, but they have this humanist, pro-individual agency, pro-free speech attitude. So my idea was these are neoliberals. But because, you know, of Roman's reasons, of various reasons, I went to a couple of meetings, and they were the first people who said, okay, let's discuss this. So, for example, I remember I was really pissed off with a smoking ban, because I like the occasional social secret. And then I started thinking, hmm, wait, if it's okay for the pub owner to have his rights respected, maybe the idea of freedom is not the worst thing in the world. But we, we, we stop there. So you are free to smoke in the pub, but that's, that's all. Then it's like, well, but also freedom of speech is not that bad. So yeah, maybe, maybe you're also, you should also be allowed to write whatever you want, let's say, in spite without someone, you know, police knocking on your door. So it was one thing after another, and, but, and also, this was the time I got serious into reading Marx. So before I was more of an activist, now I started reading The Capital. So I've read the first volume of Capital three times in some very intense reading groups. And then I saw some questions and some contradictions. And I was surrounded by some of the best Marxists in terms of how much I respected them, or old Marxists, and they couldn't give me the answers. So then it was a double, let's say, contradiction. On the one hand, the sense of life, but also, at the same time, this idea that freedom is not that bad. So then my label was, OK, I'm a Marxist, but a pro-freedom. And then the questions start piling up about, but is actually Marxism uh, really compatible with freedom? And what about the contradictions? So this was the seed of doubt. And then it was a matter of time for, for uh, slowly, slowly, slowly to abandon, to abandon the Marxist boat. What were some of the issues that were hardest for you to shift your views on? Interestingly, it wasn't some big metaphysical or epistemological issues. It was more things like, why is there an exchange theory of value, whereas the use theory of value should be all that we want? And actually, doesn't Marx say these things? So it was mostly really, really micro, micro, let's say, pebbles in, in the construction of Marxism. But slowly, you take out these small rocks, and the whole, the whole thing hasn't got a stable ground. So it wasn't something big. It wasn't something about where, for example, objectivism begins its, its analysis. It was these small contradictions. And it was that at the same time, by coincidence, complete coincidence, I discovered the Austrian School of Economics. And I realized, for example, that the subjective theory of value makes more sense than the labor theory of value. And that's how I started completely parting ways, uh, parting ways with Marxism. And do you, do you remember like what you would call like the final step on that? Like what final issue where you said, all right, that uh, like I've definitely transformed. I, I remember the first and the last one. The first was reading Jean-Paul Sartre's Existentialism is a Humanism. 
And one of my teachers, Frank Furetti, who is one of the people who has really inspired me, so he made an analysis on this essay, and this was Sartre's, let's say, best moment. And this essay is a defense of the idea of individual agency. So that was the moment that I realized, no, it's not about structures, it's about what individuals do. And the final thing, I know it's going to sound a huge cliche, was reading Atlas Tract, because this also said that, no, there's this is the morality. You already know what is the best economic analysis. You also know what is the best way to view the world through individual agency, and that was it. That's right. Yeah, that was going to be my next question of where Ayn Rand fits in here, and it sounds like sort of the capstone of like whatever remains so, attractive about the old life is, is just yeah, gone forever. Ayn Rand comes in in a painful way because I had all these disagreements with my Facebook friends because imagine I've had Facebook since 2007 and th these things happen around 2013. So the friends that I have accumulated for half a decade, they're all leftists and they start freaking out with the things I post on Facebook. So I had this one guy, which I have to say is, is an otherwise sweet guy and good guy who kept telling me you, uh, what's you are going on a very dark path. And he was like, what's the next step? Are you going to start liking Ayn Rand? <laughs> Never in my life had I heard the name Ayn Rand. So at some point, he had, he, instead of commenting on my links, he, he starts posting the links from the Ayn Rand Institute. So one moment, I Google Ayn Rand, and I see she has written the return, a book called Something with the New Left. And the new, obviously, it was the anti industrial Revolution. And the new left was a topic of my book, a critique of the new left. So my first contact with Ayn Rand was the return of the primitive. I read the first pages and I realize, why am I even writing a book? Everything has already been said about <laughs> the new left. That's, that's the real thing. And then I start reading uh, the Fountainhead. I stop at the middle of the Fountainhead because I've heard there is this other book called Atlas Rugged. I read Atlas Rugged, I return to the Fountainhead, and yeah, I'm, uh, I'm sold, so to speak. That's really interesting. And so at what point did you si decide to go for a career in academia along this journey? I already had a career in academia. So, okay. and at, so at the time I discover RAND, I haven't got still a stable lectureship, but I'm teaching part-time and doing various other jobs. So, but interestingly, Ayn RAND is not a huge problem in academia because not many people know her. So in a way, it's more triggering so to speak to use uh, someone like Friedman because some academics know no Friedman so I, I didn't have many major issues uh, back then and actually all this background with initially with libertarianism and then with objectivism in a way made also my teaching more interesting so the students in a way appreciated this new angle I, or I mean the students who were interested in it and at some point you're like that guy in the department who has this different view so you're also dealt as this exotic presence. So it's, uh, yeah, you know, that guy's there. We were going to live with that. I was interested, just thinking about your story of like, you know, years of Facebook friends who know you as having a different set of ideas and who probably at least some portion of them, you know, connect with you over those ideas. Um, one of the things that I think does stop a lot of people from questioning ideas or at least being able to like publicly endorse that instead of apologetically saying it to me at a party once every six years is is the fact that they don't want to lose their peer group um to what extent were you worried about that and to what extent did that even happen it's the number one thing that has kept me back i think the fact that i was not i wasn't more open so i've lost a friend who we were friends since 92 and before even I transitioned to objectivism, at some point I receive a long email with the, some final line, you haven't only betrayed the Communist Party, you've also betrayed Marxist Leninism, so that's it. And I've never heard from this guy ever again. And again, we're friends since 92. And with the transition to objectivism, I've also uh, missed, uh, lost, uh, quote lost, I mean, the person is, you know, he's alive and well. But I've lost one more friend who was, I would say, on my top, definitely top 10 but seeing it in retrospect the people i think who are really of good quality they appreciate the honesty so and again sometimes even your relationship becomes more interesting because 
a relationship that started based on ideas, sometimes if the person is honest, it can develop even if your ideas change because the base is still the same. Let's see what is happening in the world. Let's see, let's see where these ideas will lead us. And I've known Marxists who have, uh, who they've read Atlas Shrugged or, or they've read The Return of the Primitive and specifically with The Return of the Primitive, I've had Marxists, specifically Marxists who don't like the new left, who thought, I remember a message from a friend says, this is so good that I'm scared to read more because I'm gonna be sold or something like that. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that certainly in the U.S., a lot of people package together the left as sort of a monolith, but definitely amongst more serious people, there is this deep division uh, between Marxist, like serious Marxists um, and the postmodernist or the, the critical uh, theory crowds, the ones who are kind of more attached to the social justice elements that we've seen. Um, and that really resonates like with your experience, right? Where, I mean, Ayn Rand would even make comments about how she could get along more with a, you know, old line, serious Marxist professor who at least took ideas seriously than these kind of movements, even ones that were sympathetic to capitalism, but had a real contempt for ideas. Yeah. So there is, unfortunately, very small, but there is a stream in Marxism which sees Marxism as the best. Uh, expression, let's say, of the Enlightenment and of modernity. And within this group, you can also find the so-called accelerationists who support capitalists because they think that it's going to lead to the automation of the means of production, all that stuff. But also you can find the people who like, for example, the early Marx when he talked about freedom of speech and all that stuff. Now, sooner or later, you're going to find a way where there's a dead end. So where you cannot agree with these people beyond that. But there's something... Yeah, we, are, we have not come here to reframe Marx as a hero, I think, either one of us. Yeah, yeah, so there is... There, but again, it's... Because Marx was so contradictory, it's very easy to go in Marx and find completely different things. So you can find a Marx who is very, very deterministic when he says, for example, that... Uh, that it's the conditions that uh, determine us and all that stuff. But also you can find the Marx in German ideology who says it is humans who make history, although they don't make history as they want. So, so anyone can find whatever they want in, in, in Marxism. And quite often, when in someone's universe, their whole frame of reference is the academic left, so it's basically from Marx to Foucault. That's the Overton window. <laughs> if you have good premises, it's very easy to say, I'm going to go to the very, very early Marx of the 18th premier or, or whatever was his earlier works. And that's where I've stopped, rather than go to Grundrisse or to the Marx of uh, Das Kapital, for example. So, yes, again, someone might say you're sanctioning evil. You are, uh, you know, you are giving, uh, you are giving sanction when you shouldn't give. I think I can judge quite often people based on what what they're after so i think there has to be this distinction not sanctioning bad ideas not evading so at some point you realize that someone is after for example destruction when they say for example oh i don't think apple i don't think steve bezos should uh, have uh, so much money or i think apple should be i don't know uh, nationalized then you realize that yes now we've entered the the sphere of envy but there are also the other ones who say yes apple is okay but maybe after 80 years, robots are going to produce, and we won't even need uh, uh, Steve Jobs. You know, he will retire quietly, and the, and the robots who's going to do everything. So that's the small fraction of Marxism, which I think is worth engaging with because there's something interesting in, in, in their premises. What do you think um, objectivists and pro-liberty people What's your view of sort of what uh, things that they should know that in general they don't know, whether it's about the doctrines of Marxism, the kind of state of the movement, the state of the left overall? Where do you see as the blind, uh, the blinders for those of us who don't necessarily have a background in that? Uh, the one thing is what you said, that the Marxists are so, it's, the left is such a big tent for example, when I hear that Black Lives Matter is Marxist, I laugh. Or when I hear that Obama is a socialist, I'm very, very skeptical. 
because we have to be very precise in the same way that the left is ridiculous when they say, for example, that whoever is a, for a, you know whoever is a bit more nuanced than Jeb Bush is alt right. That's ridiculous. Or when whoever is uh, slightly to the right of Mao Zedong is neoliberal, that's ridiculous. I just but saw an article yesterday or the day before where it was talking about the, the. This is a recent article, like in the last week. The Republican Party is abandoning its laissez-faire, you know, doctrines and dogmas or yeah. whatever they put it. And it's like, yeah, that happened more than a century ago. So <laughs> I don't know yeah. that it's headline news. Yeah, it's, I, I saw it. There. By, by the way, I have to say I really enjoyed your, your Twitter kind of uh, timeline. But th- this works both ways. So my leftist friends believe that every conservative in the United States wake up and go to bed by reading Atlas Rugged. <laughs> and our people, but also people that we don't like in the conservative or the right-wing circles, believe that these people are... Marxist. These people are not Marxists because Marxism is a theory of capitalism, a critique of capitalism, and a critique for the overcoming of capitalism. Now, this critique is wrong and evil, but that has nothing to do or very little to do with what Black Lives Matter stands for, which is more to go like in peak of terms, more towards the disintegration side. I think Marxism is maybe more or the good parts of Marx is more misintegration. Anyway, I don't want to go technical here because let's put it simple. At least Marxists had a theory and a vision and an understanding of how society worked. Their theory was wrong. Black Lives Matter and what we call postmoderns or whatever, they are lacking these characteristics. Therefore, I don't think they should be, they should be called uh, Marxist because they're not. And my bet is they haven't read anything from Marx except maybe from a cartoon version of the Communist Manifesto. I mean, they're not missing much, but still, <laughs> they, yeah, they haven't read it, so they're not Marxist. Uh, that's really fascinating. Um, I'm curious as to... So I, I have a deep jealousy of anybody who has a different intellectual pedigree before they came to their current ideas because I think it just gives you such insight. You know, as somebody who's probably met a lot of people in my shoes who like all they've really had are, at, at, if not fully free market, at least free market leaning their entire lives. Um, what are some of the things that that you've noticed like, oh, I can actually understand this issue better because... I've not always held the same framework I came to it over time. Is there any areas where it jumps out at you as, yeah, I'm really happy I went through this stage of being very wrong, but it's now given me the ability to see ideas in a different way than somebody who's just taking them for granted? Yeah, but it's a bit Machiavellian. So it's it's not something that I'm proud, but I think the best school of politics, and by politics I mean the dirty stuff, Mm -hmm. is serious Marxism. And I think the only people from the other side who understand it is people like Steve Bannon and who are on the right of Bannon. So this understanding of what are, let's say, the cultural pillars or the economic pillars that the society stands for and how you can cut these pillars for the whole thing to collapse. I think this is something which is completely lacking, thank God, from the mainstream left, but also from the mainstream right. So in a way, if you've been with people who are serious about undermining this regime or bringing in a revolution. So in my Marxist days, and this was not the party line, okay, that was just me. I had the plan in my mind, for example, of how a situation that is a riot can turn into a revolution. I don't think that many people in the left do this. So when you are in an environment where people take ideas very, very seriously, although they're the wrong ideas, it's very easy for you to realize who are the people who take ideas seriously from the other side. That's why in the last years, I was very, very interested and fascinated in a horrible way, like with with fear, with the reactionary right and the traditionalist right and what people loosely call the alt-right. Because I see this in a bad way, almost revolutionary zeal. This idea that this regime is corrupt from from top to bottom, and this is how we're going to destroy it which is different from the BLM nihilism, which is things need to burn. So the one is, 
like a Machiavellian understanding of the system and how to undermine it. The other is the, 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 the road is empty because no one stands against us. We are drunk in our power and will go in a nihilistic rage. Again, That's... not all black. Yeah, not all black life activists. I'm talking about, again, the people that we see who monopolize the headlines. Sorry. Yeah, you were saying. No, I. Uh, that's a really fascinating uh, answer that I'm. I'm glad you gave because I've marveled at the kind of chess game that the left generally plays, and in particular, this came up um, in my work with Alex Epstein, the Center for Industrial Progress. There's this whole phenomenon in investing called ESG, environmental social governance, where companies are rated and rewarded for basically what it amounts to is obeying these different standards for are they environmentally friendly, socially friendly, governance friendly. And all of the standards, if you look at them, and you might even get a hint by seeing, hearing those three categories, um, it, and governance usually is focused on CEO pay. It's that basically you had egalitarian left, right, some standards. They rationalize it by saying this will make companies long-term more sustainable and profitable. And then what happened is that they very cleverly um, inject those over time in very subtle ways. Like, hey, don't you want more diversity and sustainability? And companies said, yeah, that's easy. And then it would be, all right, now we have these defined standards that we're going to rate you by. Oh, well, now I want that. Okay, maybe that will you know help me get a few more investors in special ESG funds. But then what they started doing is really engaging in this pincer movement where they got some of the big investors who, um, uh, uh, like, I'm going blank on uh, Val. Uh, anyway, the, the ones where basically they have all the mutual funds that most of us invest in our retirement fund, got them to get behind it. And so now, in effect, what they've done, and you see this in the oil and gas world uh, and coal world the most, is that they control financing in a way that's going to wreck some of these companies, even if they couldn't get their policies to punish these companies through. And it's like, to be able to see that and play that long game out, I thought was astonishing. And nobody who's even vaguely for capitalism, they don't even know that game is being played. It's not that they're bad at playing it. It's that they have no clue what it would look like to be strategic about influencing a culture in that way. But, but here's my suspicion. I don't think there's someone behind pulling any strings on this game. Oh, yeah. So I don't think that there's anyone in the left who is pulsing these things. These things happen, as Ram said, and that was very prophetic, by default. It's just that no one wants to push a bit back, which, again, was not the case with Marxism and with Leninism. This idea of the long march through the institution that Gramsci and the new left had Again, this is not a conscious plan. And this is why so many people are wrong, for example, with the Frankfurt School. They say, oh, Frankfurt School, and quite often there's a bit of anti-Semitism there, as you realize. Frankfurt School kind of, you know, they, they, they pushed to the direction. No, it's just that there was this environment where these values was the default. But this is something very different from, let's say, a revolutionary uh, overtake of a society. Because I don't think there's a specific end point. It's not that at some point these people are going to say, oh, we've put these companies on their knees and now it's time to, to impose our agenda. Because there is no such a thing. There's a loose, for a loose thing of ideas, but there is no, this is not a revolutionary movement. This is, this is a bus going towards a, towards, a, towards a disaster without a driver. Uh, I basically agree with you. I think there's, so I do think there's some recognition that if you have an influence on finance, it has an influence on the ideas in the system. And I definitely think that um, at least a s significant uh, part of the green movement deliberately has an end goal of uh, destroying foss the fossil fuel industry, and they see this as a way to do it. But I, yeah, I agree. Um, I think we're both sensitive to, and one of the things I hate the most about the so-called right is the sort of conspiracy theory paranoia like there's these puppet masters as you're saying who have a whole you know narrative written and now they're just playing it out i think it's much more the kind of blind the 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 blind logic of ideas that we're in the grips of when you have a philosophic vacuum as ayn Rand often um described it 
So, uh, yeah, with, with the ahead. green movement, you are right. But there you have the nihilist element, the destruction of... But again, you don't have a plan. It's not like right. in the 90s, you could find green books about eco-socialism, eco-utopia. Now even this is almost missing. So the deep green philosophy had the thing in the 70s. Then it, and in the 80s, and mostly disagreed. Uh, sorry, disappeared. Groups like Earth First or these dangerous, uh, weird people also disappeared because now it, it's almost the default. It's, it's almost, absorbed into the mainstream. And yeah, it's, it's absorbed. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the autopilot. Yeah. No, I, that, that's actually a really important point is that uh, one of the things success looks like is that you have less of an identifiable movement. And that actually is protective of bad ideas in a certain way because it's sort of like, you know, the difficulty of fighting a war when you're not fighting an army but an insurgency, which is, you know, it used to be, all right, the people who are the environmentalist leaders are wearing their environmentalist leader title, and you can say this is what they advocate, this is what they stand for, this is the logic of their position, because they'll be usually much more explicit about their goals and their their moral framework. Um, once it gets absorbed in the culture, it's – you say, oh, well, you're cherry picking to look at Bill McKibben. Why don't you look at like my Sunday school teacher? And why don't you look at Barack Obama? Like these are very reasonable people who, and so it provides kind of cover for really bad ideas. Yeah. And uh, for example, the people that Alex Epstein debates, again, it's not that it's not like a video game. If you defeat these people, I mean, I think he's doing a great job and these people have to be defeated, but the problem is behind them, as you said, is the school teacher, is, is the person who says, for example, in my university that when we give the welcome week packs to new students, nothing should be of plastic. And this is such a lost battle that there's not even a point to, 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 to make an argument. It's, it, it will sound so crazy as if saying, I want to put Atlas Rugged in the welcome week pack to the new students. So it has now become completely the default that even giving a gift which includes plastic is something bad. So yes, you're you're right. It's a it's a movement without the leadership because it has become the the default. Uh, so one of the things that I love about what you're doing now is, and this isn't the only thing, but um, you're one of the few objectivists, and I'm one of the few objectivists who are producing regular, like very regular uh, online content. Um, I think you're doing a daily show at least during the weekdays, and you you're doing these interview sessions. And uh, everybody here, I assume, knows most of what I'm up to. Um, what is, what's your kind of vision for what you and maybe the whole Iron Center there um, are really thinking about, like achieving over the next few years? I mean, uh, setting aside the longer term vision, which you know hopefully is like you know massive cultural change, but in terms of what you're really visibly kind of day to day focused on. Yes, yeah, so with the Ayn Rand Center, the, I think the, the kudos goes to, to Razi Ginsberg because he insisted for the daily So I was, well, you know, who's going to watch it? So I think it's important to try. So it's two things. The one is try to see everyday affairs through the objectivist lens. So go beyond the boring, you know, conservative talking point versus leftist talking point. That's mostly the work I do with Ayn Rand Center UK. And with the Ayn Rand Institute Europe uh, meetups, what I do is mostly what you are doing, is trying to find a way to, let's say, hack the system in a way that we have the best ideas, but how can we find the skills to make these ideas work? And I mentioned it to you when you were a guest. The, the example I have in mind is from basketball, and it's Houston Rockets, and how the, the introduction of advanced statistics change completely basketball. So Houston Rockets, basically, for those of you who don't know, started shooting mostly three-point shots. So in a way, they overcame the problem that they were not, they didn't have a huge budget, but they found a clever way to play. And I think that's so important in, in what you are doing and what I'm trying to pick your brain and the brain of other people. So there's so many passionate people in the objectivist movement, so many productive people. So what we're lacking there is not the skills, and what we're lacking is not the energy. What we lack is maybe a clever way to play, maybe do things a bit slightly, slightly, slightly different. And that's why I'm always very, very careful to say what I'm doing is not objectivist commentary, specifically with the Daily Show. 
What I'm doing is trying to apply what I've been taught as a student in objectivism to how I view life. And with the skill stuff that we do with ARI Europe, how can we use these skills to make our life better, but also to have a bigger appeal? That's why we had meetups on productivity, on how to be more persuasive, uh, on how to have a global appeal, how to have appeal in different cultures, how to have an appeal. For example, the issue of, rom of romance and sex and love, for me, it's so important. Most of the advice that you get out there is uh, deterministic, evil psychology, weird stuff. So this is a field where objectivists, for example, should have a say, or the things of how we like art or the role it plays in our life. So how does the philosophy make your life better, but also how can we get skills from other areas that we use to our advantage to push forward our ideas? Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. I think that um, objectivists have, one of the reasons we're not more influential in sort of the ideas within the liberty movement, uh, certainly in the U.S. context, I think is in part because we haven't, we, we've, um, overplayed one part of our hand and underplayed another. We've overplayed the fact that um, I think in abstract terms, you need a moral philosophic foundation for politics. Now, I wrote a whole book on that. And I think it's true and it's important. I don't think that necessarily actually gets us as far as we'd want to go. Whereas I think having a really intriguing things to say about how to live your life and how to view life and how that connects to creating a certain kind of society... I think that is really the, you know, the, the killer app of objectivism. And I remember after uh, the last conference that AR, I did the last summer conference, it was centered around Ayn Rand's Romantic Manifesto. And I really had the view of stressing that, hey, I have something to say about art that's really interesting. And, the, and, and that my view of morality puts art at the center of a moral life. Like, that's so intriguing and so different in terms of what it would mean to pursue happiness. Like, I'm not going to get that from Tony Robbins or from, you know, any of these kind of self-help gurus, whatever their other virtues. And and I want to see, you know, uh, that's why I'm deliberately, even though I'm focused on politics in terms of my the audience I want to reach, I'm not focusing solely on politics because I think what's so uh, can grab people about objectivism is just a whole different way of coming at life that is... Uh, interesting and valuable. Yeah, and, and just out of curiosity, for example, you, you, you're you producing so much interesting material. So there are these unusual questions, for example, the one about porn. Am I wrong to think that this also has more views? Now, more views doesn't mean that it's the best thing that, uh, you know, that one could do. But I get the idea that people are really interested in these kind of questions that some people might think is uh, clickbait, but I don't think it's clickbait. This so why is Jordan Peterson, why did he reach such an appeal? In my view, without such a huge philosophical brilliance, it's because he dealt with these things. So someone who fills whole stadiums, there are some things to learn about. So what did he do good and how can we do it 10 times better? Because we have the philosophical capital that he hasn't had. So, Yeah, no, I think it's that, look, people often... The, their search for a better way of living and a better way of thinking about politics are intertwined and one will lead to the other and another will lead to one. And that, um, the, that when, what will attract them more to a thinker. And I agree with you, Port Peterson's a good example to think about. I think the reason he got attention was that he became a story, which was courageously standing up to the mob. I think the reason he stayed a story was that he had interesting ideas uh, very eloquently delivered about how to live your life in a better way that resonated with a lot of people. And so um, my experience is sort of similar. That is the two things that get the most views, setting aside like getting a you know celebrity like John Stossel on the podcast, um, is typically, number one, conflict. So, you know, anything that I do where I'm attacking libertarians or, you know, uh, uh, so-called objectivists who are saying ridiculous things, that always gets attention. So you can put that in kind of the Peterson conflict uh, camp, although obviously none of mine have blown up that way. Um, but then the other things are interesting, relevant questions about how to live. Uh, you know, you mentioned the pornography question, anything about, um, you know, uh, 
what would you say? I mean, like basically any or or of... the daily the daily videos, for example, yeah. the productivity ones, or or the questions that you ask that you answered in the media. I remember someone asked, "What do you do if one day you have got no content?" So you encourage us to, or in one of your newsletter, you talk about Gary V. And Gary V is all about you know more and more and more content. So this very practical thing. So how do I produce more content? I, and coming from someone who has the context and the framework of the philosophy, so you know that he is not going to bullshit you with feel good or altruistic stuff. I think that's a very good. Uh, I think that's a very good, uh, very good combination. Just let me plug my because I'm running out of battery. Sorry, I'm here. Sure. So, um, yeah, yeah, no, I think that that is certainly true that that information resonates. I mean, part of it is that, you know, I've, um, I think part of my thinking, or at least this became a clear value in retrospect was, you know, I'm talking so much about persuasion and communication, but there's a real, uh, if you take an analogous case, analogous case, there's a lot of marketers, who've never marketed anything except for marketing advice. And I, I have a very low view of them, and I think smart people are very dubious of them. And there would be something weird about a persuader who only you know talked about persuasion and never persuaded anybody of anything. And so I, I've always wanted to produce other kinds of content, you know, both my own commentary, which I you know will do on occasion, uh, and certainly I've done in the past. Um, and then the other, I mean, the other aspect of it is that if I'm trying to convince, teach people how to be more persuasive, a, a lot of what is holding people back is not just the toolkit of how to be persuasive, but how to get attention. And then the challenges, the psychological challenges of making time to write, motivating time myself to write, dealing with criticism. So uh, what I view is, you know, my, my own agenda is I want to cover everything I have to cover to get the result I want, which is I want more people who are clearer on good ideas, speaking out and speaking out effectively. And that sort of the, the sets the stage then for anything that I'm going to work on. And yeah, it's being very useful to them. And the more that they perceive the usefulness other than conflict and drama is the thing that gets the most attention. And also you are so, uh, again, I got this from Gary V, but you are in a way showing us the process. So you started doing videos the moment you came back, let's say, to quote public life and social media. So we see the whole process from going for a few followers to more followers. So I think that's that's something which is uh, which is very useful, specifically for those of us who are new in the movement. So, for example, we don't know how the objectivist movement was spread. We, I, I don't I didn't even know much about the history of ARI, for example. So seeing a public intellectual doing this in real time, I think it's very helpful for uh, for the rest of us yeah w one point i'll just mention just because it was uh, advice i was giving one of my uh coaching clients that i think is useful and i don't know how much i've talked about this um i think there's a tendency when we're thinking about being influential uh, ayn rand stressed in uh an essay what can one do that it was a mistake to be asking what can i do to change the world or change the culture because she said you can't like no individual can do that and there's kind of a related point here, which is if you want to get your ideas out there, what the way I think about it and what I've actually done to good effect so far is instead find a core group of people who really love what you're doing. Because if you find something where they really love it and want to share it and talk about it, my belief is that over time you will find a wide audience. Um, you won't get lost in the noise. Whereas if it's how do I get a big audience? Well, there's no answer to that question. You can only win over people one at a time. And if you're not seeing that excitement at the beginning, it's not just going to magically appear. And, and that's basically one of the mistakes I had made during my career at ARI in terms of thinking about influences. My view of what it looked like to build an audience was, all right, I'm going to write a book and the book's going to be so good that it will take off and everybody you know, will follow me from that day forward. And that just isn't how it works. Like It, it used to work that way sometimes. And once in a while it does too, but that's always been a lottery ticket. What it is is be interesting and valuable to a group of people and then be, come to the attention of more and more people. And that's it. And actually, I would say it's even in a way risky. So I think one of the problems with Peterson was he had this meteoric rise 
So there was a point where Peterson was in the BBC having to comment on Brexit. And it was a bit hard to watch because it was clear that he really didn't know what he was talking about or he had to comment about gambling loss. And that was a bit disappointing because, you know, he gave the pragmatist answer. Well, there is some research about addiction. So, yes, it's what you said. You have to build an audience where people know what you're good at and they you give them value and then you take it from there rather than try to have this from you know from day one you go to you go to to a big audience and it's difficult for me to re, to think of a single case of someone who had this meteoric rise so you could say some people in the intellectual dark web did that so they were good scientists and because of the controversy they found themselves but again i wouldn't think that on the long term they're going to be let's say intellectual leaders it's not that you know, for everything you're going to say, oh, what did that person say or what did this person say? So, yeah, it has to be it has to be more organic, I think. And that's not a rationalization for why I haven't got a big audience. I wish I had their audience, you know, but I'm just I'm just saying. Well, but I think in the end, the precondition is produce content, like put yourself out there, get better at formulating your arguments, get better at being interesting. Like you have the advantage. I actually think you have a, a competitive advantage in the US because you have a big personality. You speak very clear English, but you have that kind of like, you know, Athens Reaction, accent, yeah. right? And which it, it makes you unusual. And that unusual is always interesting. And so by going out there producing content that not that many people listen to is the only way in very with very few exceptions to produce content that a lot of people listen to because you're going to get better your audience has time to find you and i mean you know that i think again part of what peterson had going for him is once people heard about him it was immediately the what thing people do today is they go say what have you said what's online what's available and they could go down a rabbit hole of a hundred hours which you know now is god knows how many hours and what what happens is that they live in your world of ideas for a while and over time even people who initially are skeptical if they're interested in living your world can come around um some people in the objectivist world for instance are much more you know they read atlas and bam that's it other people just swim in the waters for months or or longer and so you want a rich set of waters and obviously oh that by the way that's yeah. uh, don't let me be misunderstood with Atlas Shrugged. It, for two or three years, I couldn't tell really what's the difference between, let's say, Rothbard and Rand. But as you said, I was listening to Yaron Brook, quite often not agreeing. So, but after the hundredth time that you he listen to something, it starts making sense. Or you read Peacock's Opar for the second time, it's like, now I get it. But it, it, you, have, you need to have this struggle, this uh, imaginary struggle, because the other person doesn't know that even that you're there that you have this back and forth. And then I really like what you said, you get into their world. And then at some point you see if there's if there's some if there's something there. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think it's really creating that world. And I'm glad to see more people doing it. I'm glad to see that uh, organizations, I think mainly hey or I getting more of the existing great content out there. And particularly on YouTube, where you know, people can get it for free. Uh, I mean, they have a wonderful app, but it's you know it's a it's just amazing that you know you can type in uh harry binswanger and get hours of material because i'm from the day where you know you could pay a lot of money and wait many weeks and eventually get some tapes that uh would would give you those courses and so yeah it's it's, it's unbelievable for me to hear the history of the objectives academic center the early days where people apparently had to call and yeah it's 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 difficult even to, to 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 picture that. Yeah, and so I mean, I think just you know, we talked about early on the the advantage that the Marxists, just like religionists, have in that once you enter this world, like every question, there's an answer for it. It might not be a good answer, but that's very important to bring people further in your world and to keep them. Um, is and I don't mean that in the sense of you know we need to have pat answers to everything. But the point is that if something's hard to learn and hard to get good answers for, uh, like, you know, the answers may be implicit what Ayn Rand said or buried in some lecture that, you know, Leonard Peikoff gave 25 years ago. But what you really want is an intriguing world to spend time in and where every question has an answer, every desire to go out and create a career of this and to grow an audience. 
there's stuff on that. In other words, people feel like they're entering not just a true philosophy, but an empowering universe and an empowering uh, culture. I think that's sort of the next stage is to keep building all of that and make it so that there's as little friction between a person who wants to learn more and do more and them learning and doing more. Whereas in the past, um, in part by necessity, there has been an enormous amount of friction. Yeah, I've spent at some point probably a couple of years or at least one and a half year of being super interested in Ayn Rand and not knowing a single objectivist. Uh, mm. like, so that's why I said I had imaginary objectivist friends because I was following their work. But now there, there are not that many countries in Europe where it's not just like that very easy, you know, or you, there are Facebook groups, meetups, uh, centers. So, yeah, I think... Uh, I think I remember you said you said in a tweet back in the day, uh, I could name all objectives who produce content. Today it's difficult to to keep track. And no, it's more very, than that. It's you. Important. It's that I could literally consume all of the content that they were and had produced, and I mean that really didn't change until it started to change in the early two thousands when we started getting more books. Um, but up to two thousand, like I got interested in objectivism, and I think ninety six. And, you know, maybe 97, but the, it was for three or four years and maybe more. Um, I mean, I think even by the time I got to the Ayn Rand Institute in the early 2000s, like I had still to that point consumed almost literally everything that existed uh, in pub, you know, in public form um, by objectivists. And thank goodness that's no longer true. Yeah, of course, then there's also the, the trap that you said that you you don't realize where your skills lie and you start, you know, you say, oh, I'm going to make an objectivist analysis of uh, this thing and you don't know what you're talking about. So it's always important, I think, to to make sure that you it's clear to the people that you're experimenting with these, with these ideas, but that this is not the final world and also that you, or at least myself, that I'm not a, an authority. And this is quite often kind of a, a thin line to walk on. Yeah, and... I mean, that just reminds me from a slightly different perspective of uh, I was rereading some of what Ayn Rand wrote in The Art of Nonfiction, and she was really stressing this point of how bad it is for you as a creator to think, what should I think versus what do I think? And I think part of what, um, in effect, distancing yourself from having to be a spokesman for something does is it liberates you to be in the what do I think premise and you don't feel as if, well, I have to represent, you know, some ideology. I think it's less of an issue um, for individuals rather than individuals associated with organizations. But I, I do think that responsible, you know, people who are just starting out who want to speak out also know that they might misrepresent the ideas that they care about and know, know that they're taking risks and trying to apply it to things they haven't heard it applied for. And I, I want them to do that. And I totally get that you would worry about doing that if you felt, oh, okay, I, I'm in effect presenting myself as a spokesman. I think you're right. That just being objective about where you are, it's like, hey, I'm just, this is my best thinking. It's from a certain framework. That's my best application of what I understand about that framework. But I'm, I'm speaking, you know, for myself, not for the framework. Yeah, and it's it's also a bit liberating because then the road is open to see where your mind takes you rather than, you know, oh, I'm going to give you the party line and then you're not even convincing yourself and you're not convincing yourself means you're not going to convince the others. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, let's end with this. I wonder, you know, as somebody who did, uh, you've been exposed to, you know, the free market economics world and a lot of different universes of ideas. What are other areas or things that you would like to see improve? And, and let's just focus on the objectivist world. I think there's a lot to say about the liberty movement more broadly, but things that you would like to see improve or that you're kind of intent on helping improve. Well, with the liberty movement in general, uh, it's it's definitely the, the idea of be a bit more inspiring and don't think that it's all about economics. No one is going to go to the barricades because you're going to take the income tax for 33.8% to 32%. Or I remember the Gary Johnson campaign in 2016. Well, the right is good in some things, 
the left is good in some things, and we take these things and we're in the middle. So that's not inspiring. What you need to inspire people is this, this sense of life, this, or I would say, heroic sense of life. So I think that's the, the nuclear weapon, let's say, of, uh, of objectivism. That it's not only the principles, but it's also this, this, this vision. And also, this is very useful because my prediction is that the far right is going to counterattack, let's say, the world of today by saying this is a boring world and we bring a heroic vision. And these liberals are the boring people who just, you know, count uh, income tax percentages. And it will be difficult to defend this, but we have a very solid defense, which is that this heroic vision of life does not contradict reason, but actually it's the, it's the precondition. Reason is a precondition of it. So that's about the liberty movement. For the objectivist movement, it would be not to be afraid to experiment with more and more topics. And again, not as giving a line, but see where do our premises and our principles take us? So, for example, you know, you mentioned the, I mentioned your video on, on porn. So what are the things that people are worried about today? So, for example, I'm too shy. I can't find a girlfriend or, or guys are, uh, you know, horrendous. So try to see not leaving this terrain to people who have huge audiences but have very bad premises. So not be afraid to expand to areas that till now we wouldn't think that we should expand there. I love it. All right, Nikos, this was really fun. How can people follow your work, get in touch with you? So uh, follow, uh, uh, that's a good thing of having a weird surname, you know, they go to <laughs> Twitter and put Twitter or Instagram, Nikos Odirakopoulos. I don't think there are that many. I'm Nikos underscore 17 on, on Twitter. Uh, follow the work of Ayn Rand Center UK on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and on Facebook, Ayn Rand Institute Global, where you get notifications about the events that we have, the, the skills-based events that I mentioned that we had. Don was one of our guests, and we do every, every other week some interesting web meetups. Well, great. Hopefully talk soon. Thank you very much. Talk soon.